Alrighty, this is chapter uh, one, part B of the Pierce text, and we're going to take a closer look at the history of genetics, um, focusing on uh, wheat domestication and breeding, a few uh, examples of animal genetics, and then a really good case study of um, transmission genetics is hemophilia. So, um, when we look back at genetic history and we study how technology has advanced, some of the earliest applications of the genetic principles actually occurred during the domestication process, and this is both of our plant and our animal products. So as, um, you know, uh, plants grew stronger and bigger, we selected for them over time. And breeds of livestock um, also did this. So the animals that were more docile, more um, eager to be for or to be used as companionship, easier to train, those were the ones that were selected over time. And since then, that has really um, led into th uh, the diversity that we see in even within one species. So take dogs, for example. We have little um, pocket rat things like chihuahuas. Um, I was bit by a chihuahua, so I have little love for them. Um, and then we've got great big, huge Great Danes. And their genome only differs by uh, 0.08 percent. So that is a really, really small difference. And then, of course, in our wheat species, we've got um, our um, our older wheat species that tend to grow a lot bigger, but are subject to things like blowover. Um, they don't have a whole lot of um, stamina when it comes to being protected from the wind. So we have developed species of wheat that are shorter in stature and more protected by the wind. I'll turn my sound off. All right, and from that point on, then we went through a really rapid evolution process. So rather than letting Mother Nature take its course and letting her take her sweet time, we actually helped in the selection process. Um, so some of the first agriculture um, actually occurred in the Middle East. So uh, uh, Turkey, Persia, Jordan, Israel, those um, those areas, and our earliest recorded um, uh, records of those are about 10 to 12,000 years ago. So that starting process really has led us today to where we're at, where we have uh, more numerous seeds that don't scatter before harvest. In that example, we're really looking at the domestication of wheat as a crop. So another, um, another area that has really lent itself to um, rapid genetic progress is by use, utilizing artificial fertilization. So um, we've got records that the Babylonians and Assyrians actually developed several hundred varieties of date palms. And these date palms actually differed in fruit size, color, taste, and the time to ripen. So those um, that technology was used very, very early on, so about 850 um, years BC. So when we look at wheat, our primary one of the primary uses for wheat, both uh, historically and today, is for um, for uh, bread or for uh, making bread. So as we have gone through the the history of genetics, the domestication and the plant breeding actually resulted in an increased size of the grains. So not only is the total size of the grain bigger, but we've got different shapes and those result in different total yields, tastes, and um, leavening properties. So we have uh, been able to track the amount of gluten associated with a variety of wheat and how that really affects um, the the total type of yield when it comes to bread production. So, um, and I'm talking about gluten because it's really becoming um, a big problem in today's society. So we have actually gone through and bred wheat to be more productive. Um, but one thing that um, we didn't really count on is this gluten intolerance of our gut system. So 
Um, so wheat is going to be produced or is going to produce certain types of protein. One of those protein is, is gluten. And um, there are several different forms of gluten that can actually be produced. And those three are shown right here in the center of the slide. And um, depending on what form of gluten we actually get, um, that really relates to whether our body can actually uh, be tolerant to it or not. So this is um, because we have bred some species of wheat to be um, to be more productive. That really hasn't kept up with the integrity of our gut. So that has led some people to have celiac disease, which is an autoimmune disease. And so this is um, where in normal practices, um, indigestible fragments of gluten would be re uh, released through tight junctions and cross the mucosal layer um, in of, the, of the gut system. And what ends up happening is that the gluten um, endocytes will actually secrete certain autoimmune factors. And those autoimmune factors really leads to health um, issues with people that are going to produce abundant amounts of autoimmune factors. So um, just keep in mind, this is one, just one example of um, how we have changed the wheat product to actually now be less um, con conducive to be digested by our system. So some of the animal examples that we see in terms of his history of um, genetic progress is in the horse species. So we've selected horses for a variety of different um, reasons. So we've selected them for speed, for power, uh, for stamina, and then for agility and strength. But all of these different breeds of horses really evolved from Mesohippus, which was um, our fossil records indicate that they were actually roaming Earth about up to about about 50 million years ago. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit and look at a human condition called hemophilia. And hemophilia really has a, played a huge role in history and the loss of the royal bloodline. So um, hemophilia is a sex-linked trait, so it's inherited as a recessive gene on the X chromosome. Recessive means that uh, both chromosomes have to have the... Um, copy of the hemophiliac gene to be expressed. And so because it's linked to the sex chromosome, it can actually be passed on, um, passed on um, while being linked to that X chromosome. And so there's two chances for us to inherit it because dad's going to contribute an X and mom's uh, going to contribute an X as well. So what ends up happening with hemophilia is that we get some sort of injury. So like I say, let, let, uh, we cut our skin. And in an, in an individual that has um, the normal gene for hemophilia, the clotting factors are going to be immediately upregulated and go to work to patch that skin to stop the bleeding. And those are going to be proteins. However, if you get the um, hemophiliac version of the gene, then those clotting factors are not present, um, or they're present in a lesser amount than the normal phenotype. So you don't have nearly as much clotting um, ability. So those individuals tend to unfortunately bleed out. And so this can lead to death very, very quickly. And now we have things um, like gene therapy that can help this process, but in the 18, 17 and 1800s, they didn't even know what this disease was. So um, when it comes to looking at royal bloodlines, Queen Victoria of England, she was a carrier on X, the X chromosome of the hemophiliac gene. And so she's the, the carrier is going to be this dark circle, and you can see that it actually um, was passed on to her daughter um, Alice and her daughter Beatrice and Alice actually um, uh, married and um, had several siblings so Princess Irene who had hemophilia um, Prince Frederick who unfortunately passed away and then um, Princess Alexandra and Princess Alexandra um, was actually um, uh, uh, Russian royalty, so Romanov royalty. And so we saw extinction of that entire bloodline because of this disease.
So you can follow the genealogy. So again, here's Queen Victoria. Um, so this uh, figure is a little bit more conducive if individuals were carriers of the disease, so they have the gene on the X chromosome, then they just have a red outline. However, if they were affected, then um, they were red. So and as you can see, um, the only affected individual that was go that went on to actually produce um, offspring before he died was uh, Victoria's son Leopold. So here we can see that our Russian royal family, so Alexandra, ended up being an, a carrier of the hemophilia gene. She married um, uh, the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, and they had several children. Um, and uh, but elect and but Alexis ended up dying. So um, we've actually been able to see this gene just take um, so just uh, take off and um, really destroy entire uh, uh, royalty lines. So some of the phenotypes we see associated with hemophilia aren't just um, cuts on the outside of the body. We can also see internal bleeding, which is what um, this is right here. So we get a lot of almost abscessing, but it's really a pooling of the blood beneath the skin. So one of the ways that we can treat hemophilia is through gene therapy, where a gene is going to be isolated from a healthy subject, then cloned, and then inserted into a vector. And that vector is then going to be um, uh, transfused via bone marrow so that the affected individual starts producing a normal gene. So we get normal upregulation of clotting factors. So this, is, um, this gene therapy is utilized today um, with pretty decent success. But it's one example where we've been able to study transmission genetics um, at the molecular level and start to develop gene therapies um, to deal with these type of diseases. So hemophilia is interesting because it goes clear back to um, before before Christ. So even in the Jewish book of religious law, there's incidents of individuals that have um, that have hemophilia, um, and so this really um, is one aspect of history that um, has really affected the world and the genealogy. All right, so let's we're going to quickly move through panogenesis and germ plasma theory. And this is really where the concept of reproduction took place and who contributed what factors. So we know that today that sperm comes from the male and the egg comes from the female and they have um, their own genetic material to contribute to a fertilized zygote. However, one of the theories um, was actually panogenesis, and this is where it was thought that gemules actually carry information from various parts of the body. So there was gemules from the brain, the heart, the feet, etc. That came together in the form of sperm and an egg and was passed at conception. Aristotle re uh, rejected panogenesis and said that um, he believed that males and females made equal contributions to the offspring. offspring. So this really uh, led to two parties, uh, kind of similar to Democrats and Republicans, um, but this was the ovists and the spermists, and ovists argued that the, hom uh, the homoculus actually resided in the egg, and the spermists um, said that it argued, or said that um, it actually resided in the sperm. And a homunculus is a tiny preformed baby so that actually exists in the sperm or the egg and then just grows up in size. It's not the process of development that we know today. So this concept was preformationism. Uh, pre it occurred in about the 1600s and essentially said that all traits came from one parent. All right, so that is the end of part B and we will pick up with